Again, my name is Javier Ceja Navarro, and I am a chemical engineer working with insects at the Berkeley Lab. One of the main questions driving my research at the Berkeley Lab is, do insects contain the secrets for food and energy production, for a sustainable production of food and energy? To be honest, I didn't really care about insects and about their beauty before. And then everything changed when I came to work at the Berkeley Lab with this amazing system. I caught the bug, okay? <laughs> so after this presentation, I hope that you will get a little bit of an insight of our research, but also that, that uh, you will get to change your view about these amazing creatures. Have you ever considered that insects are everywhere? They feed on all kinds of food. They are in all kinds of environment, from the desert to the tundra, soil, water, plants, even on animals including humans. Just look at that uh, beautiful loss hanging there in the hair of a human. So what's the underlying reason behind this versatility of insects? What is giving them the ability to adapt and to survive to pretty much all kinds of environments? Let me tell you a little bit about it. Insects represent 56% of all living organisms in our planet, okay? They are the most diverse group of organisms as well, and there are estimations that we have around 10 quintillions of insects alive at any point in our planet. That's at 10 with 18 zeros. Okay. So usually when we think about insects, we will think about a pest, okay? <laughs> and immediately we will get the image of a roach in our mind. Yeah, some of them are destructive. They can attack crops or even spread diseases, but most insects are harmless, okay? They can provide a lot more to an environment and to humans, and we forget about that. For example, we can get a lot of products from, natural products from insects, including wax, for example, silk, honey. They are also models for scientific research. We can study genetics or even study animal behavior. They are also agents of pest control and pollinators. In fact, without the activity of these pollinators, many plants would disappear from our planet. And with them, also the animals that depend on them. Also, something important about insects is that they are ancient creatures, okay? They appeared on our planet 300 million years ago, just 100 million years after plants. And we humans, well, we, we came here 250,000 years ago. That's nothing. So who do you think, or which multicellular organism do you think has developed better strategies to live in this planet, to interact with the planet? Insects had millions of years to create the strategies to interact with plants, with other microbes. And while doing this, they were able to incorporate some of these microorganisms to the digestive system. There, while giving them this really nice environment in their gut, they will get the benefit of all these microbes and their abilities to transform all kinds of substances. So could we benefit by studying the perfected biology of insects? Okay. Let me tell you about the systems that we are studying at the Berkeley Lab. One of them is soil microcreatures micro from a soil that has really low content of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus is in a form that is not available for plants. Soil microcreatures and other soil, uh, soil animals, they move through the soil, they modify their structure, they allow air to go through the soil, nutrients and water. But how about the microbes that are associated with these little animals? Could they be also contributing to the cycling of carbon, nitrogen and making this phosphorus available? My other system is the pasalid beetle. This is an amazing creature, okay? These are subsocial insects. They have no hierarchy. They are all the same. They have really strong family bonds, and they interact by making sounds or chemical signals. Something that is really important about these creatures is that they can degrade wood. They are really good at physically and chemically transforming wood. In Less than one year, five of these little creatures would transform five kilograms of wood. 
So that's a lot of material. And while doing this, they are decomposing the wood, its polymers, including lignin, which is really hard to transform. And during that process, they will get all the energy they need to survive, to live. So could we harness this potential and maybe learn about it and use it for our benefit? My third system is a coffee pest. It's known as the coffee berry border. This little organism that I'm showing you here evolved together with coffee plants to the point of making coffee seeds its only source of food and shelter. Okay, so then when coffee got out of Africa, of course did the coffee berry border, it was following the plant, it's, it's, it's home. But the amazing thing about this creature is that while living in the coffee seed, it exposes itself to toxic levels of caffeine. And just to give you an idea, the caffeine needed to kill a human is 0 0.075 milligrams per gram of body mass. That would be like 50 shots of espresso for a guy of 150 pounds, maybe. So this little insect lives in an environment that has 100 times or a little bit more caffeine than they're requiring to kill a human. How is this guy doing this? Could we use this ability maybe to control it better? Okay. The Berkeley lab is a unique space, a unique place where multidisciplinary research gets combined to study well, all kinds of uh, problems, health, environment. And at the Earth Sciences Division and the Ecology Department, we have a set of experts that uh, apply omic, omics approaches, such as DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, or even the application of different analytical techniques to study the environment, being soil, water, plants, and now also insects and their associated microbes. For example, here, what we did with some of these insects was to extract their DNA, their proteins, do sequencing, and identify all the different organisms living inside of the insect. But not only this, we we're able also to elucidate the steps that occur in the insect for the transformation of different substances. For example, here, for the pasalid beetle, this is an image of what uh, his uh, digestive system would be. Okay? Once the wood enters to the beetle, it will go to the midgut. There, the polymers of wood will get transformed into simple molecules that then go to the anterior hindgut where fermentation occurs. All the energy is then produced. And then you have an extra step of, for degradation for whatever went through, okay? Another thing that we do at the Berkeley lab is to analyze the gut environment, the digestive system. How is this environment? How are these bacteria um, living in this uh, uh, internal environment. We require this if we want to reproduce this outside of the laboratory. Uh, for this, we are using different approaches, as I told you, like uh, microelectrodes to measure the oxygen in the animals, or even uh, CT scanning, like what I have in here. And with this, what we want to do is to understand how the gut is arranged inside of the little creatures. How is this uh, little refinery arranged in the animal? Once we understand this, once we, once we understand the environment, we know what these uh, different organisms are doing inside of the insect, we can try to take, them, to take them out. Here, for example, you can see several microbiology plates with caffeine, cellulose, and lignin. And the dots that you see in there are bacteria and other organisms that are able to survive using only these substances that maybe we could use later for other approaches or for other applications. Okay, so what have we learned so far? From the soil microanimals, we know that they participate in the recycling of nutrients. So could we use this knowledge to generate new soil management strategies? About the coffee insect, we know that this little creature survives in coffee because of its bacteria. So how about we target that bacteria to change the preference of the insect for the coffee seed and maybe it moves out a little bit to the fruit so it doesn't really affect coffee production? Could we use this idea of targeting bacteria to control other uh, agricultural pests? About the pasalid beetle. Here we have an amazing biorefinery. How about we mimic nature and we learn about the processes and then we create new approaches to produce energy? Humans, well, we have become really uh, 
good at reproducing and living longer. And while doing this, we are exploding our environment without really taking care of doing this with a balance, with sustainability. And this will take us to the point of being unable to provide the resources for future generations. You know, at this point, well, we are able to travel to space, to analyze genomes, to analyze huge amounts of data. How about we start paying attention to our environment, to its creatures? The key for a sustainable existence in this planet may be out there. We just need to learn from nature. Thank you.